I certainly will insist on the highest personal standards of conduct. I will insist on the highest professional standards of conduct. It may seem unfair that police officers should be expected to perform, to conform to higher standards than those which prevail generally in society today. I believe this must be so. It is essential that a police force should be respected for the right reasons. At the end, the RUC's Chief Constable, Sir John Herman, was locked in a vigorous tussle with Stoker over fundamentals of policing. They'd had what's described as a blazing row. Stoker himself, it appears, had threatened to resign. The background to Stoker's inquiry lay in a vicious shooting spree by Republican gunmen in the latter part of 1982. The intense pressures on the RUC to get results were nowhere felt so strongly as in the historic county of Armagh. The chief constable and his colleagues found themselves in late 82 attending funeral after funeral of members of the security forces. The clamour grew for decisive police action against the gunmen. And action was to come not long after three policemen were blown to bits near Lurgan by an IRA landmine. At nearby Tullygally East Road, the RUC quickly struck back. In mid-November, three unarmed IRA men were gunned down. Two of them were suspected of the Kinnego murder, Sean Burns and Eugene Toman. The third dead man, also acknowledged by the IRA, was Gervais McCurr. The police struck again two weeks later, when a 17-year-old youth was shot dead by the RUC at this hay shed, some two miles from Tullygally, and another youth wounded. The dead youth was Michael Ty. It was another name Stoker would come to know well. But also active in Armagh were the INLA. Two policemen were shot at Market Hill, and then in December 82, this deadly no-warning bomb at the dropping well in Ballykelly, killing 11 soldiers and five civilians. It was a shocking attack, and inflamed passions across the north. Again, the RUC were ready to respond. A week after Ballykelly, two leading INLA men in Armagh, unarmed, were gunned down at Mullacreevy Park on the edge of the city. Their names were Roddy Carroll and Seamus Grew. They were to be the last two names on Stoker's list of six. Six unarmed civilians shot dead by the police in the space of four short weeks, all in Armagh. It looked like a pattern to some. Now, one cannot ex escape the conclusion that either orders have been given to a special SAS-type unit within the RUC to summarily execute, peop execute people on suspicion, and nothing more than suspicion. Or, indeed, there are rogue RUC men who are taking the law into their own hands disregarding their own instructions from their own chief constable uh, and embarking on a war of attrition which can only lead to the war of the jungle and is leading to the war of the jungle in this county. But it took further developments before Stoker was called in. In 1984, in Belfast's Crown Court, police officers accused of murder in the Armagh and Tully Galley shootings blurted out that they'd been ordered to tell lies to investigating officers. It was a sensation at the time, a cover-up. The reason for it, according to evidence, the need to protect the identity of informers. An extra piece of drama was added by the evidence of Constable John Robinson, accused of murder in the Armagh shooting. He revealed that a special RUC unit had trailed Grew and Carl across the border into the Irish Republic on the night they were shot. Another bombshell. All the RUC men charged with murder were acquitted. The trials left a bad taste in many mouths. Show the love it. Give him an honor gun and he's mighty shoot all right of them. Shoot all right of them. That there isn't justice. No, that's all. I give everybody justice, but I'm very sad that there isn't justice. Enter Stoker. The deputy chief of the Greater Manchester Police Force, the second largest in England, was chosen to inquire into the affair. The inquiry was to involve the six shootings, the cover up, the use of informers and the cross-border incursion. Stoker was under rank from the start. 
The choice of a deputy chief constable was probably a mistake, but no one anticipated how high the inquiry would take Stoker and where it would lead him. Chief Superintendent John Thorburn, an even more experienced investigator than Stoker, was picked by him as the inquiry's number two. Under them, a small, hand-picked group of seven. They were a tight, coherent, and loyal team. The elite of the Manchester force. The best Stoker had under his command. And so in mid-1984, the team took up office in police headquarters in Belfast. Within a short time, their tenacity and thoroughness in seeking the truth were to shock and surprise the RUC bosses. One group the Stoker team would come to know well were the Headquarters Mobile Support Units, the tough guys of the RUC. They're the anti-terrorist section. They're mostly ex-soldiers. They tend to have a minimum of formal police training. Their HMSU training comes from the SAS. They're armed with a formidable weaponry, Sterling submachine guns, Ruger rifles firing Armalite-style bullets, and Smith & Wesson pistols. The HMSUs, in their approach to their work, have three guiding instincts. Firepower, speed, and aggression. John Stoker was to be left in no doubt about their commitment to all three. But the other aspect of the HMSU's operation, which was central to Stoker's investigation, was their control by the Special Branch. The Special Branch. At times, the Manchester-based team were to wonder if they didn't control the whole RUC. It was the case of Gervais McCurr, Sean Burns, and in particular, Eugene Toman, that yielded the sternest findings. Stoker's team found that a whole series of fundamental errors were made in the investigation of this case. Much vital evidence never reached the Crown Court. Lord Justice Gibson's court, which acquitted three RUC men of murder, reached this decision without the full facts before it. While the ruling was that the officers were innocent, we understand Stoker made criticisms of virtually every aspect of the RUC investigation of this case. The story before the court was that the car with the three men, approaching this junction, crashed through a vehicle checkpoint. Police, it was said, then opened fire. Although the car didn't crash until some 600 yards further down the road, the police said they only opened fire at it back at the junction, at the supposed checkpoint. But bullets were strewn down the 600 yards of the road and at the crash scene. How did they get there? The possibility offered was that they had been carried along on the roof of the Ford Escort, or later, in the policemen's clothing. In the police story, no shots were fired after the car crashed. In their view, the three men were then dead. The problem was that Eugene Toman's body was found outside the car. 109 shots in all were fired by the police. Although no shots were returned, police in evidence said that they thought they were being fired on. Stoker found that special branch officers had interfered with vital evidence that night. Cars and weapons had been improperly removed from the scene. Spent bullet cases were actually picked up off the ground. The scene was never properly secured. As a result, the forensic evidence before the court was seriously flawed. The Manchester team actually found a bullet still lodged in the escort steering column, months after the trial, years after the shooting. It was the bullet that probably killed Sean Burns, in the back of the car. The earlier investigators had missed it. Other bullets were found lying underneath the car at Man Road Barracks. They'd fallen out of it. The Stoker team undertook a detailed reconstruction of the whole incident using the original car. They brought over independent forensic and ballistic experts. The findings were dramatic. No roadblock, but an undeclared Wild West-style car chase.
But Stoker's crucial findings concerned what happened after the car crashed, for he decided that Eugene Toman was still alive at this stage. When did he die? The questions at the trial were, was there an interval before Toman was shot? How did his body get out of the car if, as the police said, he was shot inside while the car was moving? The inadequacy of the court's forensic evidence can be judged from one simple illustration. In his summing up, Justice Gibson retained as a possibility the idea that Toman was shot in his seat with his hand on the car door lever. He would have died instantaneously, but the dead weight of his arm or his body on the handle, pitched forward, would have opened the door and thrown Toman out into the road. Fair enough, or so the judge allowed. Except for one small thing. The handle of the door on this model of a Ford Escort does not open downwards. It pulls towards the passenger. And no amount of dead weight of an arm or a body pitched forwards would have opened this door. The court had failed on even the simplest of levels to establish the facts of the case. Stoker found that the shooting of Toman happened outside the car and separate from the chase. His team found witnesses, never interviewed by the RUC, who gave vital evidence of a time delay before the final four or five shots rang out. We ourselves have spoken to a number of witnesses to the scene that night, whose evidence would appear to be devastating to the police claims. None of them were called on by the RUC. One man in particular, a civil servant with a responsible job, who finds it wiser not to appear to camera, heard all the shooting as the cars came down the road that night, then silence. He left his home just behind me and walked the 90 yards or so to the roadside here, where he was stopped by a policeman, questioned, body searched, and sent back to his house. When he got back the 90 yards to his front door, he heard four or five single shots ring out. It was, he says, a minimum of two minutes from the time that he had heard the previous shooting. His wife, who had remained at the front door, but also heard everything, confirms this two-minute estimate. The RUC never took a statement from this couple. The inquiry's own forensic and ballistic evidence showed that the shot that killed Toman came from the passenger side, the opposite to that indicated to the court. Toman was shot at very close range, a matter of inches, through the back and into the heart. So Stoker's version of the Lurgan shooting read something like this. First, there was no roadblock, as the police claimed. There was at best a hastily contrived interception, too late to be effective. The police opened fire at the junction. An unmarked police car with the three constables inside followed the escort, directing a fierce fusillade of bullets at its rear and right side along the 600-yard stretch. As the car crashed to a halt at the junction of the slip road to the roundabout, Toman was still alive. McCurr and Burns were dead. No shots had been fired from the escort because they had no guns. Another fierce burst of gunfire hit the driver's door of the escort. But it was not this firing that killed Eugene Toman. Toman was killed by a single rifle shot at point-blank range, fired by the police from the passenger side of the car. The Stoker team produced what they regarded as utterly conclusive independent forensic evidence, which had not been available to the Crown Court, that this was how Toman was killed. The three RUC men acquitted of the murder of Eugene Toman were surrounded by colleagues after today's judgment, many of them shaking their hands and saying, well done. The three policemen had heard Lord Justice Gibson say he regarded them as entirely blameless. Indeed, they were to be commended. The judge commended the policeman's courage and determination and said they had brought the three deceased men to justice, in this case, the final court of justice. But for a lot of people, it will be very important that the three men who were shot that night were members of the provisional IRA. Do you understand that? That that would be some people's reaction? It's some people, it doesn't need to justify the killing them. Kill if this is what they were going to do, why don't come out and say it then? But if, if any man, member of the IRA is for a game, why put trying white boys it by trying to say that they have a, uh, judicial system over here that we're going to arrest people and put them through the courts? Why don't they just come out and say, well, from now on we're going to kill these people? If they're going to do it, say it. Don't try and eyewash people and tell them that they're not doing it. 
The stalker findings on the killing of Roddy Carroll and Seamus Grew at Mullacreevy on December the 14th, 1982, had many similarities with the Lurgan case. Once again, the inquiry found that the Crown Court did not receive the full evidence. A charge of murder had been before it, but the police investigation was geared to a coroner's court hearing, not a murder charge. Constable John Robinson was acquitted of the murder of Seamus Grew. In evidence, Robinson claimed that he heard noises from the car, and he thought he was being fired on. In his ruling on the case, Justice McDermott made it clear that he found Robinson's account of how and where he shot Grew to be unsatisfactory. But despite this, the judge held it was still possible Robinson thought Grew was armed when he shot him. The significance of Grew's shooting was that again the body was found outside the car. Again was he killed in cold blood. Once again, the Manchester team reconstructed the whole shooting incident with their own forensic and ballistic evidence. The unmarked police car overtook the Yellow Allegro and its unsuspecting passengers at the edge of Mullacrevy Estate. Having forced them to stop, Robinson and another constable jumped out. Carl in the passenger seat was shot dead instantly. Meanwhile, the other constable was pumping rifle fire into the far side of the Allegro. Then, reloading, Robinson came round to the passenger side door. Grew got out, and Robinson shot him through the back at a range of two foot six inches to three feet. McDermott's ruling in the trial was that the Crown had failed to satisfy him, that Constable Robinson knew that Grew was not armed when he shot him. The key information withheld from the detectives investigating the shooting concerned the driver of Constable Robinson's car. He was a special branch inspector and the senior man on the scene, Robinson's superior officer. He was present during the shooting. But he was completely written out of the evidence by the special branch. Only in court did Robinson reveal his existence, but he was not called even then. The judge in his ruling noted his absence and that of the other constable but took for granted that the evidence was being withheld for entirely proper reasons. Apart from their own forensic evidence, Stoker and his team found eyewitnesses in the nearby houses to support his conclusions. Again, these witnesses were never sought by the OUC investigators. In a calmer atmosphere, over two years later, Stoker had to answer the question, what orders were given at Goff Barracks before these shootings took place? Was the order shoot to kill? The other question was, what was the truth about the cross-border incursion which preceded the Gru and Carroll killing? Who knew of it? And how often did this sort of incursion happen on the border? All the officers, including John Robinson, involved in the Lurgan and Armagh shootings, were members of the Headquarters Mobile Support Unit as we've seen the anti-terrorist section of the RUC. They were working to and were briefed by senior officers of the special branch. They were brought down to Goff Barracks in Armagh, especially from Belfast in each case. The orders given in Goff Barracks before the Lurgan and Armagh killings were coded but deadly. The inquiry found that a highly charged atmosphere of danger was created in these briefings. The men they were about to stop were described as extremely dangerous, heavily armed killers likely to shoot on sight. The men were described as wanted and on the run. What they were not told, and what Stoker found from the files subsequently, was that no evidence to justify charges against any of the men who were killed existed. Wanted they may have been, but wanted only for questioning. The difference was crucial. On the simple question, were there orders to shoot and to kill, Stoker's team didn't have a simple yes for an answer. What they found was that at the advance briefings in Goff Barracks, the HMSU officers had been given not orders, but a clear signal that whether dead or alive, there wouldn't be many problems for them afterwards. The officers were hyped up in such an inflated fashion. They were told that the men they were about to apprehend were armed, dangerous, likely to start firing as soon as they saw the police. What Stoker's team found was that the senior officers given the briefing had given the clearest signals, only mildly coded. Dead or alive, apprehend them. 
and dead it was to be. The Manchester team concluded that the term wanted was too loose when the RUC meant suspected. This they thought a very, very dangerous use of language. Dangerous especially when dealing with young policemen without legal know-how to see the difference. But what of the RUC's cross-border incursion into Monaghan, which preceded the death of Seamus Grew and Roddy Carroll? Is it conceivable that some Gordy knew of it? When Stoker attempted to explore the role of the Gordy, he was told to lay off. Sir Philip Myers, Inspector of Constabulary for Northern England and Northern Ireland, forbade him from going to Dublin to see the Gordy Commissioner or his deputy. Meantime, queries from the Manchester police team about cross-border activity were met with knowing looks and half-smiles. The team were surprised to discover that within the RUC there were no regulations whatever barring cross-border incursions. Or the sources on the border have denied categorically to us that they would ever knowingly allow such an RUC incursion. But the same sources have confirmed to us that Gru and Carl's car was observed by Gordy that night in Monaghan and later in Carrick Macross. The guards, it seems, saw the INLA men but missed their RUC tail. An informer, Stoker was denied all information by the RUC, but our own information is that two separate informers were involved. The two informers were the veteran Republican George Points and former INLA man Eric Dale, both working in the Monaghan area. The RUC had expected Dominic McGlinchey to travel with the two men that night, and we've established that McGlinchey was visited in Castle Blaney that night by Gru and Carroll at Points' home in the Crescent, just above the town. It's now established beyond doubt that Points, who for long was a trusted member of Provisional Sinn Féin and even of the IRA, was for years informing for both the guards and for the RUC. McGlinchey, for reasons that are not yet clear, decided on the night not to travel with the two Arma men. But our information is that Gru and Carl had another appointment that night. At Inish Keen, beyond Carrick Macross, they were due to pick up explosives prepared by the other informer, Eric Dale. Eric Dale was also a long-standing Republican activist. He'd gone with the INLA in the mid-70s. But in 1982, he was informing to both the RUC and to the guards. We've spoken to Eric Dale's guard the handler, and he's told us that he met Dale on a darkened roadside near Coot Hill, County Cavan, just two days after the Armagh shooting. Dale was in a very shaken condition. He told the guard the officer that he was half to blame for the shooting of Gru and Carroll. He said that he was supposed to prepare a bomb that evening and leave it at a wood near Inishkeen to be collected. But he got drunk and had failed to do so. Eric Dale has since been tortured and shot dead by McGlinchey for informing. So, the RUC's cross-border route, according to our information, took the two officers to Monaghan, Castle Blaney, Carrick Macross, Inishkeen, and then back again towards Keedy and Armagh in the north. As the Allegro eventually headed back north, the second RUC special branch man was dumped in the Republic to make a hurried phone call to Gough Barracks. They're on their way. But disaster struck as two British Army intelligence cars and the HMSU team with Robinson and two others in it sped out quickly to meet the Allegro near Paper Mill Bridge. There was to be a pile-up on the icy roads that created utter confusion. As the three security forces' cars were immobilized, the Allegro sped by, unhindered and, it seems, unnoticed. A non-existent roadblock was later invented to cover this pile-up. An officer was even rolled in the roadside dirt to make the cover-up seem more credible. But the police car that overtook Gru and Carl ten minutes later in Armagh was in fact the same one that had followed them all day. Its driver, as we've seen, was a special branch inspector. He gave no evidence in court. His very existence was concealed. A 
And yet this inspector was the senior man on the scene. He was a key eyewitness. No one was better placed to tell Constable John Robinson exactly who and what was in the Allegro before the shooting started. I think the, the way the RUC investigated and handled the whole affair showed it showed their utter contempt for the feelings of the nationalist community who were already saying that these people and our people who were shot in Oregon had been murdered. The, they were, the way they investigated, the way they handled the investigation and the subsequent trial in which one particular High Court judge congratulated RUC men for more than three people in Oregon, congratulated them on their mark, marksmanship and said that they brought these three men to the ultimate court of justice, although these men were never convicted of anything, and they were shot without even getting a chance to defend themselves. In part two, we look at the findings in the Hayshed killing at Ballymeary, the cover-up that followed, and the role of the chief constable, Sir John Herman, in the whole affair. The shooting at this Ballineary Hayshed near Lurgan within two weeks of the Tullygalley and Armagh killings had the same stamp upon it. There was an admitted RUC cover-up. Once again, the HMSU were involved, and an effectively unarmed youth was shot dead. The Stoker team found here a crude attempt to suggest that Michael Ty, the dead youth, had paramilitary connections. Intelligence data affixed to his file had the wrong date on it, the day after Ty was killed at the Hayshed. There was never a prosecution of the RUC men involved, but Ty's companion, Martin McCauley, a politically active youth, was found guilty by Justice Basil Kelly of possession of three old rifles found inside the hayshed. Crucially, there was no ammunition. The guns were virtual antiques, though partially in working order. The fact that there had been no prosecution of the RUC on this case, coupled with Ty's complete innocence, made the Ballineary Hayshed case crucial to the British investigators. The key discovery here was that vital tape recordings containing potentially crucial evidence were kept secret by the RUC and the security services of MI5. Knowledge of such evidence was withheld from the Macaulay trial. The picture that emerged from the inquiry's painstaking research was of a major surveillance operation on the Hayshed before and during the shooting. Contrary to court evidence, the RUC were laying in wait in large numbers. The court was first told that the RUC saw men with rifles going into the Hayshed. It was only then that the police approached it, it was said. This story was later dropped, but even then the court was not told the amazing truth that when Michael Ty was shot, Senior RUC men were listening on headphones in far-off Armagh. The information that the Hayshed had an electronic bug in it placed by the police changed the whole nature of the shooting. What the existence of the tape told the Stoker team, first of all, was that the RUC must have been aware of what was in the Hayshed that day. They weren't coming upon it for the first time. After all, they'd been inside it to plant the electronic bug. They'd also allowed a large quantity of explosives to be placed inside it. The OUC knew this Hayshed inside out, and it's inconceivable in these circumstances that they would not have known that there were old guns inside, old guns without ammunition. And on top of that, there was a very strong police presence in this area all day. There was a police car on the road just over there for most of the day. There were a large number of officers in the barn who came running out after the shooting. The Stoker team concluded that it was an ambush. The guns were placed in the hayshed to be found. Unfortunately, they were found by the wrong men. But what was on the tape? Was there a warning shout before Ty was shot, as the police claimed and Macaulay denied? A silence on the tape before any shots would have been devastating to the police case. The Stoker team's reconstruction of the shooting with independent ballistic and forensic experts discredited the argument that Ty was pointing a rifle when shot. The entry and exit points of the bullet through his body were not compatible with RUC evidence. Besides, what unexplained madness would make anyone point an unloaded and useless gun such as these 
at the RUC after a supposed warning had been shouted. In the Macaulay trial, Justice Kelly himself decided to disregard the RUC testimony. So far did it differ from reality. But later the Stoker team, having learned of the highly secret evidence kept under lock and key, became convinced that Ty was shot dead by a bullet through the heart, fired without warning. They wanted to know why were the full facts behind the shooting not declared, and even more important, who all knew of the secret evidence. It was the dramatic evidence in Belfast Crown Court that superior officers had ordered lies told that provided the starting point for the cover-up investigation. But in reality, the cover-up was a much more complex and multi-layered process. It continued long after the Crown Court proceedings had finished. Publicly, it had begun with totally false press stories issued from the RUC press office after each of the three incidents. False roadblocks, false chases, false accounts of the shootings, all issued from headquarters. It continued shortly afterwards with lies and false stories told by RUC officers to their detective colleagues investigating the shootings. It included non-declaration of police witnesses, interference with forensic evidence, a failure to interview eyewitnesses, and a generally grossly inadequate investigation. One of the first high-level failures was the RUC decision to appoint three separate investigating officers for the three cases. This, despite the fact that they all took place in Armagh within a few short weeks, involved the same special branch men, the same HMSU units, and unarmed civilian fatalities. The next step was RUC advice to the North's Director of Public Prosecutions, Sir Barry Shaw, that there be no prosecutions. Sir Barry said no. He turned down this early RUC resistance from his office in Chichester Street. He ordered prosecutions for murder. This was in 1983. But the determination of special branch officers to resist investigation guaranteed the case presented in court was a weak one. The revelations in court came as a bombshell to the Director of Public Prosecutions. He had been kept in the dark in a totally improper way by the RUC. But it didn't save the DPP from an extraordinary public rebuke from Lord Justice Gibson. He said in his court ruling that the Lurgan prosecution should never have been brought. Criticizing the North's Director of Public Prosecutions, the judge said the evidence was tenuous and there was never the slimmest chance of securing a conviction. The total injustice of these criticisms became starkly clear to the Stoker inquiry. They were viewing from the inside a jungle of poisoned high-level relationships. In particular, the relationship between the Chief Constable of the RUC, Sir John Herman, and the Office of the DPP, Sir Barry Shaw. The DPP is an independent public official, charged with deciding what people are prosecuted and for what offence. But his pivotal role in the criminal justice system is utterly dependent on the police. It's dependent on the facts they gather and on the facts RUC officers pass on to the public prosecutor. A pattern of the withholding of information from Sir Barry by the RUC was becoming clear to the Stoker team. After the revelations in the trials about lies, cover-ups and falsified evidence, it was once again the DPP who pushed the RUC's chief constable to investigate these shootings further. But the dragging of heels over fabrications such as these was not over. The Deputy Chief Constable, Michael McAtamney, was appointed to conduct the RUC's internal inquiry into the cover-up. This investigation was later found to be too limited by far. The simple questions, who ordered who to lie, were not being asked. Why was this not done, Mr. McAtamney was asked. Not in our terms of reference, he's understood to have replied. The Stoker team were disturbed at the apparent lack of commitment to getting to the bottom of the matter. They knew, too, that if the Deputy Chief Constable did have restricted terms of reference, they could only have been set by one man. After the McAtamney report on the cover-up, the DPP was still deeply dissatisfied. It was he who then insisted that an outside police officer be brought in to investigate the goings-on within the RUC. And so John Stoker and his team came to Ireland. 
but the Manchester team was to encounter further prevarication, further delays, further direct obstruction during the two-year inquiry. The resistance was to continue when eventually suspension of several senior officers was mooted. There was finally a blazing row earlier this year between Stoker and the Chief Constable over the disputed tape. Sir John refused to release it until eventually, surprise, surprise, it was the DPP who ordered him to do so. Soon afterwards, Stoker left the inquiry in controversial circumstances. So, who was responsible for the cover-up organised locally from Gough Barracks? Stoker sought eleven prosecutions on charges of conspiracy to pervert the course of justice. This number included a number of constables. But it also included the inspector who had become the invisible man at the Gru Carroll shooting. He was the senior officer on the scene, and yet he was completely excluded from the evidence. This inspector should be prosecuted, it was concluded. So with this, responsibility for the cover-up reached above the constables into the officer rank up to inspector. But there was more to come. Also recommended for prosecution was a chief inspector, since suspended, who was considered to have played a significant role in the cover-up. So now the trail of responsibility went from the rank of inspector to that of chief inspector. It was getting higher. Next on the stoker list was a superintendent, also since suspended, who had played an important role in organizing the cover-up. The trail continued upwards. Constables, inspector, chief inspector, now superintendent. The layers of the onion were peeling away. Finally, another officer, seen as having played a key role in the cover-up, a chief superintendent, was recommended for prosecution. He was described to us as one of the sharpest, shrewdest, quickest or you see officers around. This was where recommended action stopped, but it wasn't the end of the trail, because none of these ranks accepted full responsibility for the cover-up. There had been phone calls to headquarters, the Stoker team were told. It was a corporate decision. There were consultations. It was, they said, a Chinese parliament. The inquiry was clearly not yet complete. The two main ranks above those indicated are Assistant Chief Constable, Head of the Special Branch, and Chief Constable. There was other evidence. It concerned the pile-up at Paper Mill Bridge in Armagh before the shooting of Seamus Grew and Roddy Carroll. In itself, this accident at Paper Mill Bridge might have been of little consequence, indicating only the degree of confusion which there was on the night. But the accident was to acquire a far greater significance in the cover-up which followed. In order to pretend that the accident never happened, a false vehicle accident report was prepared. This document spirited the vehicles away to a point some 60 miles away from the scene of the accident. But the most interesting thing about this false accident report was the signature which it bore on the bottom. The signature belonged to the RUC's Assistant Chief Constable and Head of the Special Branch, Trevor Forbes. The Stoker team questioned Forbes about the signature. He agreed it was his. He did not remember signing the document. But there was no doubt the document was false, and the signature was that of the Assistant Chief Constable. Nonetheless, it is significant that no prosecution or disciplinary action was recommended against Mr. Forbes. And this community has got to decide uh, to support the police fully. We desperately need the support of the community, right across the board, because at the end of the day... It's the he was new into his position at the time, and there was no evidence otherwise associating him with the cover-up. The Chief Constable of the RUC has a natural responsibility for what happens in his force. Faced today with evidence of a cover-up among lower ranks, the question is, can he distance himself from all responsibility for his subordinates' actions? Sir John Harriman has made one crucially important statement on this whole issue. It came after the trial of Constable John Robinson on April the 8th, 1984. He said, 
I do not believe there was any criminal conspiracy to cover up. What there was, and still is, is a critical and completely proper need to protect operational methods and police sources of information. It's not exactly clear what Sir Jack meant by this phrase, completely proper. On the face of it, he seems to be saying that a cover-up that is designed to protect the identity of an informer, as was the case here, is completely proper. But Sir Jack must have known that this is not the case. These Home Office guidelines, agreed by all police constables and issued to all police forces in the United Kingdom, state that the police must never, never commit themselves to a course which, whether to protect an informant or otherwise, will constrain them to mislead a court in any subsequent proceedings. It goes on, this must always be regarded as a prime consideration when deciding whether and in what manner an informant may be used. In the context of this, it's very hard to understand the phrase completely proper. We require greater support by the community because this is so vital to success. But that support and any participation can only be within the law. By joining the security... As Assistant Chief Constable, Sir John Herman has a direct responsibility for the SAS-style training and operation of the HMSUs. Yet... It was their techniques of firepower, speed of response, and aggression, and their special branch control, that proved so disastrous in the Stoker cases. Areas where fear and apprehension exists. We have learned that Sir John made a determined intervention in one of the Stoker cases, long before Stoker reached Ireland, long before any trial. In fact, Jack Herman intervened personally to avert a trial. He received a file urging prosecute from his investigating officer. He then added a letter of his own urging no prosecution and sent it to the DPP. The officer's analysis never reached the prosecutor. This omission, although in no sense illegal, is regarded as dubious. Again, the DPP, backed in his London office by the Attorney General, Sir Michael Havers, would have none of the Chief Constable's appeals. Prosecutions for murder were instituted. And it was at this stage the cover-up began to unravel. In the Hayshed killing of Michael Tye, there was other evidence involving the Chief Constable which worried the Manchester Inquiry team. This evidence concerned the question of who knew about the tape at the time, and who later conspired to keep it from the DPP, and from the courts. While the Hayshed was under electronic surveillance, explosives were removed from it and used to kill the three policemen bombed at Kinigo. There are potentially massive insurance implications in this for the Police Federation and the families of the three dead officers. The explosives were under police custody. The crime may therefore be judged to have been a preventable one. The chief constable happened to be nearby when the Kinigo bomb went off and visited the scene, as pictured here, within minutes. And there he made a surprising disclosure. He asked the investigating officer, Detective Chief Superintendent Jackson, were these the explosives the force was supposed to be watching, or words to that effect. Chief Superintendent Jackson, not surprisingly, didn't know what he was talking about. No one would have, except for a small number of Special Branch and MI5 personnel. But did Sir John Herman know? Did he know of the special surveillance even before Michael Ty was shot? Did he know of it while the DPP was being kept ignorant of this potentially crucial evidence? And later, did he know of it when the Stoker inquiry was being kept in the dark? The judge is totally independent. He has we have established also that Jim Pryor, Northern Secretary, before any recent publicity, was aware of the special electronic surveillance on the Hayshed. In the light of the death of Michael Tye, an innocent youth in all accounts, the conspiracy of silence over the tape recording requires a substantial explanation. I wouldn't want to tie myself to any specific kind of inquiry. 
the sort which leaps most readily to mind is an inquiry under the 1921 Act, with powers to summon witnesses and, and to call for papers. But I can see certain arguments against that. That would be chaired by a judge? That would be chaired, I imagine, by a High Court judge or someone of that caliber. With witnesses subpoenaed, forced to appear before the court. Th that's right, yes. But as I say, I wouldn't want to tie myself necessarily to that procedure. What is important is that there should be an inquiry uh, at a level which would satisfy the public that the, mat the matters have been properly investigated. Would it be a criminal offence to mislead the Director of Public Prosecutions? Uh, it is a criminal offence to conspire to, to cause a miscarriage of justice, and that might be an element in that, certainly. Or to mislead the court? Well, that would almost, that almost certainly be uh, a conspiracy of that kind, yes. And for a police officer to, to be aware of evidence which was withheld from the Director of Public Prosecutions or from a trial from a court judge would never be acceptable? It would never be acceptable. It might amount to a criminal offence. And if such a police officer were the chief constable of that force? Well, on your supposition, if it were the chief constable, then clearly this is something which ought to be made public and appropriate action taken. When the stalker team began to operate, and the people came forward as witnesses, and we saw how thorough they were and all, we began to think there's some hope here that for the first time uh, we will have an investigation outside the IUC themselves. And, and now it seems to be a thorough one, and all we're interested is in the truth. And then you had this tremendous shattering thing uh, that Stalker was, uh, you know, he, he, he didn't matter, the individual didn't matter, that he could that the Dirty Dicks department could do away with Stalker in the interest of covering up uh, an injustice. Uh, we can list at least 140 different killings of, 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 in, of civilians, of executions and, and gunning downs by security forces for which nobody has been held responsible, except in the case uh, of the shooting of Kids O'Reilly in of a Torch Lodge. You're saying that all these killings, or some of them, or many of them fit into the same pattern as the killings which John Stalker was investigating and which yes. now form the basis yes, of, of the report. I do. Apart from uh, getting uh, people and making them amenable and putting them through the courts and putting them into jail, there has also been people summary, uh, summarily executed. And I think that at the present, that is what has led to the whole outcry about the shoot to kill policy. I, I think that present, uh, if, if, if men with weapons are found in compromising situations, that they won't be taken prisoners, that they will be shot dead. Well, the Anglo Irish Agreement, uh, the only good thing about it is just in existence are no more. But can it deal with this situation? Can it deal with the aftermath of the Stoker affair? I don't know. It's, it, the Stoker thing will badly tarnish it if, if it doesn't. We just want the truth. And uh, if Peter Barry and Tom King can't tell the truth or can't get out the truth, uh, what hope is there? I mean, what are they for? Are they not for the common good? Uh, are, are, is our governments now to be, to be immoral? And I mean, uh, uh, truth is expected of the ordinary citizen, but is, is it not to be expected of those in charge? You know, feel and, and truth will not go away. It 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 has its own way uh, uh, of coming under the door, like the blood under the door, you know, and it will not go away. It would be better for them to tell the truth, because if it's confidence they're looking for, we will have more confidence in people to tell the truth. But if it doesn't, we'll just we'll just be happy enough to say, okay, we accept it. Uh, it is a jungle, and how long that'll go on for, I don't know. But they won't gain our confidence by covering it up. When John Stoker was abruptly taken off the inquiry this summer, he had yet to submit his analysis of how the RUC's failures could be corrected in future. Those who have spoken to Stoker say that Mr. Colin Sampson has not since sought his opinion, an absolutely staggering omission. Stoker, it seems, was about to propose root and branch reforms of the RUC's way of doing things. One of the conclusions that was unavoidable was the need to rein in the RUC special branch.
the RUC Special Branch had become, in one phrase, a firm within a firm, an influence paramount in the RUC. There is in the RUC a unique Senior Assistant Chief Constable position, whose role is partially to keep the Special Branch and the CID working separately and efficiently. The inquiry found these procedures were being bypassed. The Special Branch had a special line past Assistant Chief Constable John Whiteside through to the Chief Constable's office. The inordinate power of the Special Branch. This lay at the heart of the Stoker team's analysis. At the top, a direct line through to the Chief Constable, bypassing the established procedures. Further down the ranks, what was described to me as a stranglehold over the investigating detectives of the CID. One police source said, if a detective can only ask the questions that the special branch allow him to ask, he might as well go home. He's not a detective any longer. The other reality that was discovered was an almost universal desire within the RUC's detectives that the power of the special branch be broken. They told Stoker's team, we hope you succeed, but we think you'll fail. The evidence suggests that had the final Stoker report ever been written and submitted, it might have covered the following areas, sweeping through the organization of the RUC. New relationships between the Special Branch and the CID, giving the detectives back what they'd lost, freedom to investigate fully. New procedures between the Chief Constable and the DPP, to guarantee the prosecutor's access to all relevant information. An independent outside element in police investigations into police shootings to avoid against precisely the sort of thing that the inquiry had found. New procedures governing the press office to avoid the issuing of false statements to the public. New accountability of officers for weapons and for notebooks to eliminate a dangerous looseness in basic police procedures. Meanwhile, almost four years after the six deaths, the concerned people of Armagh have yet to see any evidence that justice will be done in these cases. Even the coroner's inquests remain to be held. And while the jury may still be out on the capacity of Mr. Colin Sampson to address squarely the age-old difficulties of the Irish question, few observers now expect this affair to produce Britain's finest hour.